Hi, I'm Frank. Welcome to HB Insight Series, where we enter the minds of artists. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the HB Insight Series. My name is Francesca Ferrara, and I am joined with Richie Dang, my co-host for the day. Hello. And our special guest, Richard Holler. Hello, Richard. Howdy. <laughs> and how are you doing today? Um, well, that's a loaded question. <laughs> uh, but uh, personally, I'm doing fine. Yeah. Okay, good. In this wild, crazy world. Excellent. And Richard Holler is an actor, director, writer of many different mediums and uh, is associated with HB now. And um, we're going to talk about how you got started and your journey and your struggles as an artist just making theater in this world and why it's so important to keep doing it. Um, right, Richie? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and, and maybe... Uh, you know, explore some some of Richard's uh, your inspiration and and then some some of the things you look to, you know, to to refill the well, so they say, as an artist uh, to keep on going. You know, that's very yeah, it's important, and sometimes is that is difficult <laughs> to yes. refill the well. Yes. Um, so let's uh, start with so Richard, how old were you when you discovered that you had the artist inside of you that was itching to get out? Well, I mean, I, I saw a play when I was around seven years old, and, and I instantly said, I have to do that. But when I was 14, I directed my first play, um, which was crazy. I was a freshman in high school, and uh, the third grade teacher in my sister's school said, these kids, I can't control them. They're completely out of control. I need somebody to come in and, and, and take over. And I stepped up to the plate. And um, that was my first show, and uh, I've been sort of dealing with rambunctious people ever since. <laughs> uh, but it was it was it was kind of nice that like my first real theater experience was directing rather than acting, even though I've done you know a lot of acting through the years. But uh, I've always like if the job needed to be done, you know, and nobody else was doing it, I just sort of said, okay, I'll do it, you know. And I learned how to direct as I went along. You mm -hmm. know, so, can you tell the story about that that you? Told me yesterday. <laughs> Wait, oh, the oh, the the, uh, well, yeah, the, the, the end the, of that production. Yeah, <laughs> the very first, uh, very first show I did was a nativity play, and it was very traditional. I, I you know, I, except we used a wagon instead of a donkey, and you know, a lot of stuffed animals instead of live animals, and a raggedy Andy doll instead of a you know regular doll. It was just, but but it was still very traditional in that you know the shepherds were in bathrobes and the, you know, and the <laughs> angels were in their holy communion dresses and and it all you know we had this big tableau at the end where all the angels were up on top of the choir loft and with the with these cardboard wings on all these white dresses and then everybody else in front of it and the day of the show one of the girls showed up in a royal blue <clears throat> bridesmaids dress because <laughs> her mother could not find her holy communion dress and so i had like <laughs> 11 angels, white angels, and one blue angel, and I was horrified, and I, everything was ruined, and, I, and it was my first show, and it's, it's, you know, and it was just one of these whole things, as, as, and everybody was, seemed to be enjoying the show, and I was just sitting there going, oh, God, when, she, when, when those angels come out, it's just, you know, and after the show, an old lady came up to me, and um, she shook my hand, and she said, are, are you the one that put this together? And I said, yes, and she goes, your idea to use that blue angel was brilliant. <laughs> she said. She said it showed. She goes. It showed us something about you know, like that our Lord is forgiving and and, and inclusive of everyone, and you know, and and I stood there like dumbfounded, you know. But <laughs> but I realized then that you know I had you know I had to start looking at things differently, and certainly through the years we've had all sorts of surprises and catastrophes and changes, you know, in shows, but I always go back to that blue angel and say, well, maybe it's a blessing in disguise. Maybe, you know, maybe it's that flaw that we need to have as human beings, you know, so that maybe the flaw is what makes the final product good. You know, if it's all perfect, maybe it doesn't work as well. I'm starting to, you know, but that lady taught me that a long time ago when I was 14. When you were 14. Yeah. No, it's amazing because it's what you, you know, you were stressing about obviously moved her deeply and it shows just that any piece of theater or piece of art, it hits everyone such a different way. Right. And if the audience is down for the ride, they're going to make sense of any happy accident. Right, that she thought it was a that, choice, you know, right. that I had done that on purpose, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, so. And a beautiful choice that to have that unique 
yeah. angel in there. Yeah. I love that story. And there's, it's, I'm sure, countless theater stories. I'm sure we all have those stories that were a oh, happy yeah. accident, but yeah. it turned out to be brilliant. Yeah, it's like the show must go on, you know, yeah. in, in a way that, like you were saying, like brings in those imperfections or just the loose ends that you wanted to have tied. And right. um, there's something about that. It reminded me, like, a, there's like a Buddhist expression about like Buddhists sweeping. So they will sweep the floor, and then when they're done, they'll take a leaf and then throw the leaf after they've swept it. Just, right. to, just to signal to themselves that, yeah, you know, the work's never done. Right, and, and the Mennonites have a thing where they make, make a quilt and they purposely make one mistake in the quilt so that they show that they are imperfect, you know. And Wow. Yeah, it's... it's uh, I like it's, that. Yeah, and the Buddhist thing is the same. It's, I think... It's a wonderful idea, but you know, we we in our society of like it's got to be perfect, it's got to be right. Mm -hmm. You know, we forget that that the imperfection is often where the beauty is. Yes, the crack where the light shines through. Yeah, right. Who says that all the time? Um, it's Leonard uh, Leonard Cohen's song, but it's uh, yeah. Teresa. Teresa yeah. right. McAuley right. says it all yeah. the time. One of the right. instructors here, and that's the beauty. Yeah, that's the imperfections can be the beauty for sure. I like that. Um, when I sweep now, I'm gonna throw a leaf back. <laughs> because I'm going to do that right. because I, it is true, right? We are sort of trained eh, eh, even subconsciously to think like everything has to be just so all the oh, time. Yeah, that's what's yeah. modeled for us, you know, in education and politics, you know, it's, you know, sports, you know, the number 10, the perfect score, all that stuff. Yeah. But we are breaking out of that, yeah. trying to break out of that all the time. Yeah. So did that when you is that when you caught the bug, Richard? When you were fourteen? Um, well, I mean, I just never stopped. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I just th then there was the next play and the next play, and then in high school, you know, I was I was not, I was a nerdy kid. I wasn't a, a, a an athlete or a brainiac or any of those kind of things, and so I was just an artist. I didn't know what that's what I was, but I, you know, and so when I we couldn't you know get into the break into the plays, you know, we formed our own theater company, and and I ran this little theater company in high school, and we toured shows, and we did all this kind of stuff, and you know, it was, uh, you know, we were in the other plays, we were always just like in the chorus, but like then we got to play the main roles and stuff, which was fun. Was it? Um, I think we were in. We were. We well, we met by um, an act of fate that I'll never forget. Oh my God, I almost started to cry. Um, <laughs> but uh, we were in Mercedes Rules class together. Right. And Mercedes does a life story exercise where you go on stage and tell your life story to everyone. And you said something like, um, I'll, uh, uh, yeah, I, I'm just always doing a play. I always have a, a show going, I always have a play going. I'll just be doing that till I'm dead. And, and Mercedes said, well, how do you know you won't be doing a show in heaven? <laughs> right, I know. <clears throat> I know. It's, it's, it's funny because, you know, I, I remember my father once saying to me, he's like, oh, when are you going to, you know, like, start, you know, looking for some real work. And I says, this is real work, you know. And you yeah. just you just keep going, you know. I mean, that's I mean, when kids tell me now, you know, students come up and they say, how do I get started? I says, you just get started. And then, and yeah. well, then what do I do? He says, you just keep going. You just don't stop doing it, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, yeah. And if that passion is there and if that drive is there, you know. Yeah. Was, yeah. And Mercedes said that too, always be... In, uh, on stage, in front of people, in a group, or writing, or doing, just if you're constantly doing, you will right. get connected to the people who are also doing. Right. And then you'll be yeah. doing together, and producing, and yeah. creating. Yeah, and, and it was funny, too, because like the, uh, us kids were kind of like misfits, you know, and, that, that, and that's always been in my, <clears throat> sorry, in my theater, you know, career, my teaching career, and I've always gravitated toward the kids that don't fit in mm -hmm. and I find oftentimes the most talent there you know mm -hmm. untapped you know and you know which has brought me to the work that I do now too you know what I mean but but uh, just looking for looking for um, the work in places that people don't normally look yeah you know yeah so. and so um, in high school and college and thereafter who were some of your mentors that inspired you to keep going. <clears throat> I mean, like actual people or like, you know, yeah. oh, the people, teachers and oh, stuff like that? Yeah, teachers and or um, people that you've read. I yeah. know you're yeah. obsessed with one such <clears throat> mentor now. That <laughs> well, uh, yeah, my very first one was Sister Marlene in eighth grade. Um, we went to a play. She saw how much I loved it. And I, she said, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, an actor. And she said, well, then that's what you'll be. 
And that was the first person who ever gave me permission to pursue what I wanted to do. Everybody else said, an actor, what are you, crazy? And they don't make any money and blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? And just yeah. that simple statement of then that's what you'll do. And, and I've been doing it ever since. So she was a real important person to me. In high school, I had a drama teacher that... that uh, he was different. That he didn't do the stock things. He did unusual pieces. He crafted pieces to us. You know, I mean, that was at the time that the Me Nobody Knows was out, and he did a little section of that. And so there were there, there was you know several teachers who were really important. Um, when I got to college, um, I just in terms of people in the theater world, I discovered Clifford Odets, uh, who remains to this day my absolute favorite playwright, and and. Uh, just recently was able to communicate with his son, which was quite a thrill f for me. Um, and because what he wrote about was working class people, I come from working class people, it's what I know. And he, he was one of the few playwrights that was really dealing with people who don't know where the next buck is coming from. And uh, so many of the plays that I've been reading were just about all these kind of highbrow people and stuff like that. But, uh, mm -hmm. so he was the first and then that, you know, then I found other playwrights as well, but, uh, so he's a hero. My first teacher in the city, Jane Frankel, who um, when I first showed up, when I first got to New York and I showed up in his office and sat down and interviewed him, and he says, get out of here and go get some experience. And I was insulted <laughs> and angry and hurt. And I thought, who is this mean man? And then I did exactly what he said. And I came back a couple of years later and he welcomed me in and I ended up working with him and producing showcases for him. And he became a dear friend, you know. Did he remember? Oh yeah, yeah, but 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 I mean, but like that's the way he was, and I appreciate it because the thing with Gene was that he was tough, but it was because he cared. He wasn't foisting his ego around. He was, you know, he really. I mean, his his notes, he would scream at you, but you, it was like love, you know, because yeah. you knew he that he knew that you were talented, and he knew that you weren't using it properly, or you weren't accessing things, or you were afraid, and and he was just shaking you up to, you know, and. He, he had a great impression on me. And uh, so I, I, you know, and he was kind of in the theater community, considered a little odd, a little eclectic, you know, uh, but I loved him and I'm so grateful that I worked with him so many years. Did, did you uh, did you follow up and say, well, well experience, what do, you, what do you mean by that? Like, or was did, was it clear in your mind? Like, oh, or no, your, I mean, what, I, what, I, I looked at him, you know, and he says, you need to you need to be in some shows. You need to, you know, you know, it was just, he says, you have no practical experience. And I started telling him about my college. I don't want to hear about college. I don't want to hear about college. College <laughs> is college. This is life. You know, I mean, he just, he just, I was like, Ooh. you know, it was like everything I had done didn't count. It didn't mm. seem, you know, wow. but he obviously saw something in me mm -hmm. because he said, he says, and come back. You know, that was the, that was the thing. The door was always open. He didn't say, get out, I never want to see you again. You know, he says, come back when you've got some experience. Yeah, he was challenging you. Yeah, so it was kind of cool. Mm. When did you feel you were ready to, to come back to that? To the <laughs> well, I went and I studied with Jack Garfine at the Actors and Directors Lab and Judy Novgrad, and then I, and I did a bunch of shows. I ran a theater company for eight years. You know what I mean? Like, I really kind of like, you know, got oh. a lot, got my feet wet, you know what I mean? And then I showed back up in his door and... And he says, are you ready? I says, I'm ready. And he says, all right. <laughs> and then how many years were you with him? On and off. Um, I mean, at first I studied about three years with him in a row, and then I would go away and come back and go away and come back. I mean, every coming five or six years, I'd go back and do another couple of classes. and then, Or he would call me and say, I'm doing a showcase. I need, you to, I need your help, because he knew that I was, you know, uh, by theater. You know what I mean? I could act and direct, and so he always wanted my help there too yeah and you're an organizer yeah and he was he was a great inspiration to me as a director because he too he, he he would not put anything on the stage that was superfluous ever there was no fat in his productions at all it was just very everything was just just popped you know what i mean he didn't mm -hmm. there was no soft pedaling with him and and that was a good way to learn yeah is that yeah i mean i when you say that i it, like no fat I mean like is it is that what you see as speaking from like the director's lens is that is that you see you, you see your role as a director kind of someone when you, and you also used earlier kind of talking about your high school teacher crafting plays for the you know the students or the actors in the room mm -hmm. is that you do you see your role as a director being that kind of finding a way to distill a play 
in a way that makes it pop? Can you talk yeah, a little bit I about mean, that? And, and I mean, I think casting has a lot to do with that. You know, like the current project I'm working on, I mean, casting was just so key. And like, I remember when I was young, I took a big uh, chance. I was directing a show and there was a kid, I, it was directing uh, Tom Sawyer. And there was a kid, I needed a kid to play the, the foppish cousin of Becky Thatcher or something. And, and I had a kid that wanted to audition it. And he was, he was kind of tall for his age and overweight. And, and he was a little effeminate. And it was like, there's all these things. And I thought like, oh my God, he'd be perfect. But then I thought, oh, but is he gonna think that I think he, you know what I mean? Like it was so weird, but it was when I started mm. to learn to, 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 to just let him read for it. You know, just give him a chance, and he blew everybody away. He was such a terrific actor, and I started to learn that that like really, you got to start with what you what you're given with with the actor that you're given, and and look for the things that they can bring to the role, and you know what I mean, and and not be afraid that you feel like you're marginalizing, or, or I, I don't know what it is, it, it, and it's not so much even so much the way people look, it's it's it's, it's their energy that they have, mm -hmm. you know what I mean, and and. So like I was said, like, you know, the, the troublemakers would play troublemakers and the really shy kids would play, you know, you know, it's these like really the, the close, essence, yeah. yeah if the essence I mean? of the actor matches the and essence if, of and the if character. And it's something that they've considered to be a deficit suddenly becomes the thing that uh, makes them, you know, pop, as I keep saying, you know what I mean? Like then suddenly you've done two things. You've brought the right, uh, you know, energy to the role and you've also helped that actor to, to own something in themselves that they might were trying to kind of get rid of because they didn't think that that was appropriate. And I keep telling them, I want you, I want you, I want you. Right. You know, and, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. and that goes along with Stanislavski, who I well, know yeah. you're also yeah. a huge fan of, is the bringing yourself to right. the character. You know, he says, he says, you are more interesting than any character you'll ever play or something like that. You know, he's mm -hmm. got something along those lines. I, I think that's, he was really, I, I, I think Stanislavski was brilliant. I really do. And I think he's, Got kind of a, I think when people sent him up the river, they were wrong. <laughs> I'm bringing him back. <laughs> yeah. I guess that's what you bring up Stanislavski, and like there's been, you know, there's a lot right now uh, discussion of, I think there's a book that is coming out talking about the method recently and, 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 and the process um, uh, that actors may or may use to prepare for roles. I mean, what was, was that, as an actor myself, I wonder, you know, it, when when you were heard, you were asked to, hey, go get the experience. Was it was it the professional experience, or was it the kind of the lived experiences as that you experienced as a person that helped you, you know? Well, I think I think answer. both. I really think both because you, you look at life differently when you're preparing to be an actor or to work as an artist. You know, you're, you're realizing that that life is your palette. The life is mm. is your school, your research. You know. And mm -hmm. you, you don't just sort of walk blindly through anymore. Everything is a lesson. Everything is something that you can use, you know. Um, <clears throat> and Stanislavski, you know, was that was really, he talks, I mean, I just recently read My Life in Art for the first time, the whole book, and I'm reading, rereading the, you know, right now, Actor Prepares, you know, just looking at these things that I read a million years ago when I was, you know, so young. And um, what he's saying, I, I think a lot of this stuff with this, he, he didn't like the word method. He didn't mm -hmm. like that people called it a method. He didn't want it locked down like yeah. that. Mm -hmm. He said it's fluid. It keeps changing. It keeps moving. And I think that that's something that a lot of the places kind of m missed. You know what I mean? That that it's, you know, it's almost like fundamentalists. You know, they get stuck on certain kind of things. And, and you know, realize that life is evolving and things are changing and adapting. And, and we need to do that, too, as artists. Yeah, and I think I really... I, Actors can draw from all different teachers, whatever works for for them. And I think Uta would have been one of the first people to say, if something doesn't work for you, you know, just let it go. And yeah. I think her exercises were really for problem solving, like an issue that you were having. If you were having an issue making an entrance, here, go, go do this exercise and you'll work it out. Yeah. So she, I think she also... Um, you know, she didn't want her exercises referred to as so much of a technique, but as, you know, just a process and a journey to go on to observe yourself. Because like you just touched on, it's like actors and all artists, you have to observe life so you can put it on stage and mm -hmm. it be truthful. And, and, you, and when you make those choices rather than following something that's dictated to you, you know, that yeah. inculcates, you know, your 
you know, uniqueness. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. And, uh, you know, and your process and how yeah. you would get to, you know, point A to point B with a character to then have the audience witness that. Yeah, everyone's process is very um, unique. Yeah, yeah. Mm. It's like those, it's the creative choices, right? I think that's kind of when, if if, if anything, it's like, I think the, um, what the, when I say creative choices, I guess what, what the whole point of having a process is so that you can feel you have agency as an artist on stage mm-hmm. or, you know, in front of the camera or what, whatever, meet, yes. whatever it is, but that you, you feel so. Um, so, yeah, just having that. And if and if you don't have that, then what do you then what you're left with is what cliched or playing the stock or yeah, these hackneyed sort of you know versions of things you know, which is you know in in with young actors you know I I, I teach um, acting at John Jay and you know a lot of these this was this young woman came in the first day of class and she was just acting up a storm she was doing all those things she was just you know rolling her eyes up and doing you know so every every everything you saw she was doing she had seen somebody else do and yeah. she was just imitating it and mm-hmm. when I told her that there was no acting in this class she was highly insulted and she goes uh, excuse me but it says here in the syllabus that this is an acting class and I says you know but you know, but she really she got it through this semester, and at the end of the semester, it turned into a gorgeous performance of this Clifford Odets piece, and um, and she came up to me afterward, and she s- admitted that she had uh, she says I really fought you, I really resisted you at first. I says, oh really, Tamima, uh, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she goes, but I I get what you're saying. She goes because I really enjoyed doing that. I says, yeah, and it was pretty effortless. Didn't look like you were doing anything at all, and we wow. were completely absorbed in what you were doing and she I said it's very mysterious isn't it and she goes yeah you know so yeah and that's yeah. all that's all Stanislavski stuff you know, yeah it really is and when I watch you teach that you are the master at breaking down resistance and and direct and I, you know I see you just like crack the resistance with a sledgehammer <laughs> in people which is not easy well i think it's because i'm very resistant and i always was <laughs> and, I, and i think i see that in other people and i go okay huh. yeah you know it you're, could you, be. you feel like you're on the right track like yeah. if there, you sense resistance and it's like oh wait there's something here what's underneath this and so i i guess you've obviously learned over the years to be gentle in, in that in in a way that to 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 find out what's underneath and, yeah. and get to the personal. And, 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 and I learned from Gene, too, to be tough, but but to never, ever go at somebody. You know, mm. it's like where it's they're not the problem. The problem is, you know, mm. something that we're dealing with, in, you know, in the play or in the scene or, or, you know what I mean? But, like, the actor is never the problem. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And so let, um, let's talk about, let's uh, swing over to your work at Otisville Prison and how you got involved there and subsequently how Ad the Acting Out Company came out of that experience. Um, so how did you uh, did you end up first going to Otisville Prison? Well, it was funny. When we, you were asking me before about something about, like, the challenges of my career and what that was like, I feel like, it, you know, we all know how hard it is to do theater in New York City and, you know, and with, you know, in, at certain <clears throat> levels of theater. So I decided to make it even harder <laughs> and go into a prison where I had absolutely nothing. You know what I mean? And 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 t- talk about resistance where, where people were like, you know, trying to 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 trip everybody up. Um, but I think I've learned something in there that was really, really valuable. I mean, that, you know, since I the theater that I've done since I started working in the prison, it's like when there are problems now and there are issues, it's like, oh well, that's really nothing, you know. You know, be compared to the kind of things and, um, that that I dealt with on the inside, and you know, I you know I've for years for like the last thirty years I've worked like uh, teaching, uh, working with like I said I started with rambunctious third graders and then uh, graduated to like you know <laughs> high school kids at risk teenagers and 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 I did a lot of that with kids that nobody else wanted because they were too uncontrollable so. I started teaching this acting class called Acting Out. That's where the name Acting Out came. And um, and it, I had remarkable success with these kids. I mean, it, it just, there's something about theater that channels this energy. And and and, uh, and I've done it, like I said, for years. And then I was doing a reading at the Fortune Society, and a guy came up to me, James O'Barr, and said, 
I run a little theater workshop at Otisville Prison. Would you come up and teach a master class? You know? And I said, oh, sure. You know? And I went up there, and uh, I was intending to just do it once because it was like no pay. There was no nothing. You know? And, and uh, it was one of the most remarkable two and a half hours I've ever spent. And, um, and, and I thought, well, that was a great life experience and thought that was the end of it. And uh, they <laughs> called me a couple months later and said, well, they want, guys want to know if you'll come back and do it again. And I said, one more time and that's <laughs> it. I said, I have got too much going on. I cannot afford to, you know, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Ten years later, <laughs> five, six. Every Friday every night. Every Friday. I mean, it was it, like that second time, it was just like, I mean, they couldn't fit them in the room. You know, it was just wow. everybody, you know. And um, and so and I did. I mounted five full productions on the inside, brought two productions in from the outside, and you know it all sounds very inspirational and lovely and wonderful. But it you know it was backbreaking work at times because there's just so much. Like I said, there's so much. You know, you go into the theater and you've got a light board and you got a sound board. And you, got, you know, I mean, we had to use like a boom box and Home Depot lights and. And, you know, I mean, like everything was sort of jakey, but, you know, and then, of course, the, the men themselves, you know, you would lose your actors, like, right before the production because they'd get in trouble and get sent to the box or they'd get transferred to another prison or they'd have a loss of rec, you know, loss of recreation. And so there was just all these these huge challenges, mm -hmm. you know, but we pulled it off. I don't know. It's just we pulled it off. Theater is an amazing thing. People go up and stand up on a stage and everybody looks and suddenly, like, so much is forgiven and so much is allowed and something happens, you know? I was amazed. Every single show, I, 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 there's not one show we did inside that I wouldn't say wasn't, like, a smash hit, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, and what happened was men started being released and getting out and they would say, Rich, well, you know, when we get out, what do we do, you know? And I would always have projects, and if I had a project and they were right for it, I would call one of them up and, I would, you know, tell people to get in touch with me through my website. And you got to be very careful about that. You can't be giving people your name and number when you're inside. Inside, you can just yeah, say, yeah, there's I've a got lot a website, of rules. You know, my name, you know, that's all you can say, and they figure it out. But, um, and then I, I don't know, it was when I started working with Mercedes here, or starting acting, and I met you, and, and, and I thought, like, the guys kept saying, Rich, can't we do this on the street someday? And I was like, well, where are we going to do it? Yeah, literally on the street? You know, I like, no, <laughs> yeah. you know. And, and, and then I thought, what about if there were an acting school or an acting or, or a theater organization that would host mm -hmm. a company of formerly incarcerated people? And I had a <clears throat> nice promo that I used, and I sent to Edith Meeks, who runs HB, and she was, everybody's very moved by that promo. It's really a gorgeous promo. It's, it still moves. I watched it recently, and I started crying when I watched it. It's, and it's, talk about the Blue Angel. It is, like, so rough, the sound, you know, <laughs> but there's something about the imperfections of that piece that make it really strong yeah. and powerful. And she said, I think this, let's give this a try, and we did a little... Uh, sample thing at, at the theater. This is right mm -hmm. on, what, 2019, right before the pandemic? 2019, December, yeah. Which was incredibly received. It was really beautiful. We pulled together some of the guys and put something together. And then we started classes. And then, of course, we know what happened in the pandemic. But, like, the thing that's amazing about that is that we went online and the company stayed alive for two years, four productions, four productions. Yeah. Over two years that almost killed us. <laughs> I'm serious. Poor I mean, really. it, yeah. it, it was hard. I would rather do a show in a prison any day than do one well, of those Zoom productions. It was clearly training for you to, I mean, you were yeah. talking about the obstacles you faced at, right. uh, up in Otisville and then the pandemic, I, you, you seemed like be ready for it in terms well, of what it, were some of the challenges it, in, in doing a way, this. And I think, I think yeah. the guys that were in the company too, they were like, this is nothing, man. You know what I mean? Like the, we've been through. Shifted, you know. yeah, yeah. They shifted right over. Yeah. So it, it was like I had the right people. You know that they, they weren't gonna. You know, and they were determined to do it. And and uh, so I mean, this kind of project that we're working on right now, which is really, in a way, is the f is the arrival of this company after all this after ten years in the prison and two and a half years online and during the pandemic, and here we are going to arrive this August on stage with, uh, you know, a company of actors, you know, 
many of whom you know were incarcerated and and who are some who are reprising roles that they played inside wow which is really amazing and um and I'm just sort of stunned by the whole thing. It, it's kind of hard to believe. You know what I mean? That that this is actually happening. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because it really is impossible. This is an impossible dream. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <it> really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like it, 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 it seems like you're just you just kept following what came next. What well, comes like, next? Yeah, like what, what we talked about earlier. Just keep doing it. Yeah. You know what I mean? I just kept doing it. Yeah. And we also, in Mercedes' class, when you told your life story, you mentioned that you were teaching at Otisville. And I was reading a book by Harriet Walter at the time, and she talked about teaching or, you know, doing theater in prisons. And so I approached you afterwards and I said, that sounds really, uh, I would love to talk to you about that sometime. I'm really interested in that right now. And then you said, oh, well, you know, I sometimes we have women come and act. And if, if I ever... Um, need an actress I'll call you and then a couple weeks later I think someone um, dropped out of right. your yeah, show I had, I had, yeah. and he called me and said were you serious <laughs> I have a role right. fill out this paperwork right now and I shot it right back to you and so I was in this is this inside Otisville and right. now I'm going to be in it on the outside with my same scene partner right Lud, who, who got out and then was 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 re-imprisoned not for a crime but for from ICE or something he was, had some kind of a problem and you know, and was held for a long time, and now is out. I mean, like, like miracles. All these it's like miracles. That miracles that happening. keep happening. And here is going to be Francesca and Lud back together. You know, uh, doing that scene. And tell about um, um, the first rehearsal with Esco and Jose. Right, Esco and Jose. Uh, Esco was was from a, a earlier time at, at Otisville, like maybe eight years ago. I had Esco. He was never in a show because he got transferred or he got something happened to him and he got removed. And then he came back when he was out and acting out started. And uh, Jose is somebody who I just had very recently at, at uh, Otisville. And the first day I had a re I had cast them both in Paradise Lost. They're both perfect for these roles and it's really, really coming along beautifully. And they were meeting for the first time on the street in front of HB because you know, I said, I'll wait for you outside you know, so you know where you're going. And Esco gets out of the car and Jose's standing in the scene. It's like, Esco? He's like, Jose? And the two of them go running to they had been roommates or cellmates at a prison like five years ago or something. Oh, and here fantastic. they are. <laughs> and then here they are working together as yeah. scene partners in, in, a, you know, in this show. And they were yeah. like, it was such a reunion. It was it's like, a, yeah, it's a miracle. Yeah, really, that is, that is happening. That's the universe working yeah. to put things in place. Yeah, yeah. So this is this is acting out members and professional actors and, and some of your students from and, Jay, and a John Jay. Of students from John Jay, LaGuardia, and NYU. And Richie Dang. Yeah. And, Richie and, Dang. Yeah. and you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we and, will all be acting yeah. right. in it together. Yeah. And, and the material is, it's, and then there's published scenes by Clifford Odets, Michael Gazzo, Tom Topor, you know, Stephen Natalie Gerges, and, and uh, Lorraine Hansberry. And, um, and all these scenes were selected, the original, this is this, by the inmates at the time. And they, they wanted scenes that they, we keep using the word popped, but that really popped. They would not settle for anything that they felt was kind of like half, you know, hearted or something. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so, um, so they turned down like incredible playwrights, you know what I mean? But you know, and then but then chose the ones that they wanted, and, and that and it really paid off, you know what I mean? It really, really paid off because I and I feel that now, post pandemic, the political situation in the world, you know, like all this stuff, that this show has, it's like, ten times more relevant than it was when we first did it. Yeah, yeah. it hasn't waned. It's waxed in terms of its importance and its meaning in the world today so i i think it's 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 it i don't know i'm kind of amazed at how um potent mm. the production is mm -hmm. and damien um talk about damien damien walker yeah he 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 created all the spoken word uh poetry that that interweaves through the whole play and connects all the scenes and he's a wonderful performer and a wonderful writer and a wonderful person. And, and, and he's really, you know, he's the linchpin in this. He's really, uh, it's kind of like his show, you know? Yeah. And he's like, I told him, I says, you're like the puppeteer or whatever. And, you know, and you're just, you know, yeah. 
you, you know, he just brings the scenes on and then dismisses them, you know, and they do what he needs them to do. And then he gets back to his story, which is about the state that this, that we are in today, you know, which is pretty, pretty uh, critical. Yeah. Yeah. And then it, uh, my question here is like, what do you, what do you, what do you, which, what do, what's your, you, you speak about, um, the potency and the, the power of, of theater making and then, and, and the, of this, if you're of the company and this production in particular, um, it, it's, you know, I think coming out of the pandemic, um, you know, theater was being experimented in different ways we, we online and there was a reach there with online. Cause I mean, there was, I remember, cause I was part of that as an understudy and right. seeing everyone come on, you know, people that were in, the past productions uh, of the of the acting on company, um, family members and things like that, being able to patch in. Um, are you, uh, is what what have you thought about how this is going to reach how the, how you're going to reach more well reach people and now that it's going to be on stage in person how 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 do we navigate that going forward to to, to help? Um, I guess my question is how can we help bring theater. Do you have any ideas or thoughts about how we can share theater more broadly the way that we were able to do in the pandemic with technology, right. mm. but like how can we do that, you know, yeah. present day? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that it's definitely a trade-off. I mean, the one great thing about being online was that people in California and Europe and, you know, everywhere could watch the shows and, and, and had access, and I also had access to performers that could be anywhere. Um, but you know, what we lost was the intimacy uh, and the power of a live production and yeah. the connection and the, and the, the palpable uh, pr presence in the room when human beings gather and, and then, then, you know, emote that thing that we do, you know. And so I think we, we have to sort of, you know, sacrifice that. But I think it's, it's worth it. You know, I think, and, and this, there were certain men that said that, you know, like they were done with the Zoom thing, you know, you know, because yeah. it, it, you do feel like you're kind of shouting at a wall, you know, mm. you, you know, it does come through. And I, I've had I've seen things online and I've been moved by them and they've gotten through to me. But for the performer, I don't think it has the same feeling as when you when there's an audience there and you can sense they're receiving what you're doing yeah. and, and then sending back to you something. You know what I mean? And I think that that's. That's what I can't wait to get back to. I mean, we were in the theater the other day. Melissa was just showing me the theater because I, I said, well, I'm going to look at the theater again. And I, and I, I started crying. Mm. Yeah. Because it's my home, you know, the theater. It's been, and it was just so weird being away from home for so long. Yeah. You know, so uh, I think that it is a homecoming. And I think this is happening with theater companies all around. And I think it's wonderful and... and I think it will more than compensate for that reach that we had, but I think that that reach was a good thing. I think we, you know, it's we reached out in a certain way, and, and people are going to find their way to us. I think, you know, and there are going to be hybrid things, and there are going to be more close circuit things. That, you know what I mean? For those people who don't have access to the live production. Excellent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The orchard. The orchard. Excuse me. Right now, with um, Jessica Hecht and Mark Nelson, they have. There is a live. Um, performance of the show and there is also a virtual and you can actually when you buy a ticket you can buy a ticket for both if you would like right. to see both so it is interesting I mean things are changing but yeah there's nothing that compares to having the the live witness in right. front of you and um, can you talk a little bit about the if, if there is a difference of having when you would have audience members come into Otisville, like what is the difference between witnessing a theatrical production in a prison as opposed to on the outside of prison? Right. Well, when I first started, uh, the first show that I did at, at the prison, I just assumed it was going to be for the prison population. And then I was told that I could invite people from the outside, which really surprised me and kind of thrilled me. And so I got on the horn, you know, and it, it was a whole complicated process, you know, because everybody had to fill out paperwork to come in. It was, you know, eventually they made it a little bit easier, um, uh, one of the superintendents. But the thing that, the first thing that I noticed is that you, you call people and say you're doing a show in a prison and you get all these people like, oh man, that sounds really fantastic. Oh my gosh, that's incredible. That's so intense, you know. Well, are you going to come? 
uh, but you know, I got so much going on, you know, and like, and we, <laughs> yeah. we get, you know, and then you get, I, I would have like 60 people make reservations and 30 of them would show up, you know, so that's one mm. thing that you find out that there's that reality. But then there were those 30 people who showed up. And um, when we first started doing it, the audience, the outside audience, the civilians as they were referred to, would sit in the first two rows of the theater. And then um, and the inmates would sit behind them. And then we would do the show, and then afterward there would be a Q&A, and then after that, the civilians were able to mingle with the inmates and have some conversations, and I found that that was probably one of the most valuable uh, parts of the whole evening because people were mixing that would never have mixed and having conversations because they both witnessed something on the stage that had mm. unified them and brought them together, yeah. you know. And so it was... Um, it was a. I often found that the talkbacks and that, that mixing afterward, like I said, were just as powerful, maybe even more so than than the show. The show was a catalyst for that kind of connection that I mm. think we really, really, really need in our society. And so, I think it's a remarkable, um, just a remarkable setup to be being able to, to to you know have a, have art bring people together in a way that they don't come together. In through, through bars, sport. yeah, yeah. Through bars or, or through yeah. the system, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Mm. And then it sounds like there's a, a a sense of community started being born out of this act. I mean, this theater company that you acting out, yeah, there yeah. within the prison. But then, I mean, then then you talked a little bit about outside of the prison too. I mean, can you speak to you a little bit about that? Just. I mean, the just the, the kind of community that you eventually built with, you know. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, well, it, 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 that too is, is, is all very <clears throat> tenuous, although I'm seeing now with this production, like there's quite a few guys that, you know, I've worked with before that are back and around, you know, you lose people, they fade away, you know, and then they come back. Um, but yeah, there is a, there is an odd connection uh, well, it was funny. It was just recently Father's Day. I can't tell you how many f Happy Father's Day texts I get from these guys. So, you know, no, I am a father, oh. but I mean, but they're, I'm not their father. <laughs> but 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 I think they see me that yeah. way. You know what I mean? And and that's a that's a missing figure in many of their lives. And then it, and but then it kind of makes them brothers. And, I, and it's just this kind of weird. Um, there is an interesting. There's a sense of fierce loyalty. Um, coming both ways and, and also the other idea that like what Gene Frankel taught me years ago when he kicked me out of the office and told me to come back like when anybody leaves the company you know what I mean um I always say you're always welcome back you know and I think for these men in their particular life stories that's not something they were ever told to come back they were told to get out and stay out mm. and um Wow, and yeah. I, th I think that that's a, a new concept for them, this idea that they can come and go and that, that they will be welcomed back, you know. And, and that really is the case. Nobody has done anything, you know, that would warrant, like, oh, I never, you know. I mean, people can, you know, people are people. But um, I don't know. We, we have this common thing that we love, that I loved when I was 14, that, you know what I mean, and they found it in prison. They love theater. They just love it. <laughs> And like when you love both love the same thing, it's that creates a bond that is really yeah. hard to break. Yeah, especially with theater, I think, and, yeah. and artists this is a very strong bond. Yeah, walk into any dressing room, you know, in, in an off off Broadway theater where everybody's jammed up, you know, and you're like, <laughs> and there's, but there's just such a great feeling there, you know, yeah. such a great feeling of community and family. Yeah, and I think the the audience that you built on the inside i think anyone that came to that first show the 30 people that did show up continued to show up they show up i think every time you send something out yeah <laughs> because they just right and those people showed up on the zoom productions and and they'll be showing up in august at hb you know the theater because um They've been. They've really followed the progress of this company. It's. It's. it's it, it is kind of when I was sending you know out notices and stuff like that. It's. It's like wow, we're still doing this, mm -hmm. against all odds. Yeah. Plus the pandemic. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Plus you know, the pandemic, right? Which is you know has just ended so many things. You know, and and yet we flourished. We kind of stayed afloat. Yeah. You know. So. Uh, 
obstacles are us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we got it. Like the blue angel continues. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, and it, it seems like you, you said we were still doing this against all odds. I mean, is it, it, it and you said these earlier there today, you were, were talking about you, f- you find the work to be very relevant right now with what's going on. Is that, is that, is that what you as a director, or as a writer, as an actor, are you always looking for that? How, it's not just about making theater in a vacuum, right? Or like, or experiencing mm. theater in a vacuum. It's, 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 it's relational. It's, it's, in, right. it's, it's contextual. What, so is, is, can you speak a little bit about that? Like how you, how you, you said Clifford Odette's working class. There's some, there's some, I, I feel like there's some, there's some themes in your, in your, in your um, career that have, continue to propel you forward. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I remember one of the, one of the greatest compliments I ever got was from a, a colleague who came to see, I was working on this piece, Fathers and Sons, the original Fathers and Sons, and then I adapted it and did it in the prison. And she was sitting there watching the scene, it was between a father and a son where the son was a young, the father was an immigrant and didn't speak English and could, was illiterate, and the son was very smart and was going to college and did not want to was trying to get out of taking his father. The father wanted to go to the college, and you know, and he was embarrassed of his father. He loved his father fiercely, but he was embarrassed of his, you know, illiteracy and and, and his accent and all. You know. And she was sitting there the whole time, you know. And then and it was done. She said, "Richard," she goes, "I've seen so many things l- lately." She goes, "But this play," she goes, "it's really about something." You know, and I and I, I just felt so complimented by that. Be, you know, and you know what she was saying is about something that really matters. It's it, you know, which is human beings trying to connect and trying to love each other against all odds. You, you, you know, and and, um, and I think that everything I've ever done from that first nativity play and to to, to this show, this is this is I, I just won't settle for anything less than that, you know? I mean, it, it comes down to, like, the corny thing, you know, if, if they laugh and they cry, I'm happy because, in other words, we've gotten in there and touched people and given them an experience and, and, and made them think and feel and walk out of the room different. You know, I remember when I was young going to the theater, I mean, like, I had several seminal experiences with shows where, where like, I would walk out and I was, like, dizzy. I, I, I couldn't... I, I couldn't think wow. I was feeling yes. so much, you mm-hmm. know, and, and I want, I loved that being taken out of my, you know, and I've been wanting to do that for other people. And that's, and so I won't do a show that doesn't have something in it that's going to rock people, you know. And um, I think it's, it is, it's, it's, it's that wanting to give back what was given to you. Yeah. Feel something. Is that something, is that feel that is it, you said love. Is it? Is that what it is? Is it? Is it about love for you? Like, where is love? It's all in about all love. these relationships. As far as I'm concerned, it's all about love. Yeah. It's. It's. That, 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 what else is there? There's fear <laughs> and there's love. Do we want to live in fear? or Do we want to live in love? I want to live in love. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. This is very poignant after art past couple of days we've had in this yeah. <laughs> yeah. in our country but yeah. um so yeah that's beautiful um beautiful way to look at it and um we have a few minutes left so um what uh if you could write a love letter to artists in training or young artists or artists anywhere over yeah. the world what would you say to them um I mean, you kind of just said it. <laughs> but I would just tell them how lucky mm. they are to be an artist. It's, you, you, you can't make that up. You can't buy it. You can't learn it. You are an artist or you're not. And I would say, count your blessings. Mm. You know, you're a channel. You're, you're a teacher. You're, you're an example. You're a light, you know, Embrace that, love that, and when it gets really hard and it's all that kind of sh- stuff. <laughs> yes, yes, we are. Uh, <laughs> so close. I, I'm so close. 
Um, but uh, <laughs> you caught yourself. You did. Yeah, I did. I did, I did, I did. But you know, I mean, but but th- th- uh, that's what I'm saying because it, like so many artists beat themselves up and 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 uh, for not having gotten this award and that banana and that you know all those you know crazy things <laughs> that, you know and, and, and it's sort of like like you've got it all you've got the gift you've got the gift mm. and, and a lot of people have a lot of those things but they don't have that gift you know and you know and some people have both well jolly good for them yeah you yeah. know what i mean it's just there's a whole range of, of people but uh but yeah when i see when i'm when i'm in my classroom and i see these you know i've got this one kid who's in this show um and i saw him the first day he walked in class and he was just kind of like <laughs> looking around like this but i could tell he liked the room it was a black box theater and he was just like this is cool you know, and I thought, oh, okay, he's like, he's one, <laughs> he's one of us, you know, and he's in the show and he's doing a beautiful job, you know what yeah. I mean? And and uh, and I told him, you know, recently I said, I says, who's though? I said, you know, you're good. You're you had talented. him for one semester, yeah. and now he's in the show. Wow. Yeah. yeah. He yeah. came all that had a journey in the first semester, yeah. right? And, you know, and now he's oh, yeah. in. Yeah. He was like, he started, you know, it was like, you know, I need to be set up. He was like setting up the chairs. And we, it was like, <laughs> like real theater person. You know what I mean? Like doing all the stuff, knowing what needed to be done. You know, can I fix those lights? You know, and it's like, you know, so yeah, I, I think that, that young artists just need so to be, much to be encouraged because, you know, we live in a country that doesn't, you know, like in other European countries, a lot of times the artists are really supported a lot better than they are here. So we need to support them emotionally, you know, mm-hmm. if we can't financially. Yes. You know, so. it, yeah, it's like that message of, of, you know, you have the goods already, you know, you're enough. It's you, you are, there's no one else like you. Right. Um, <laughs> exactly. You know, it's like, and it's so right. hard to hear, you know, personally live out too. I think it's, um, as a, you know, actor, aspiring actor or writer, you always think, oh, from a deficiency mindset, like, oh, I haven't done enough work or I haven't done enough this or I haven't done, it's hard to sometimes just kind of give in to the idea that, oh, I, it's already here inside of me. Right. If I could only I've just... got what I need. I know I had an acting teacher, Jack Garfine, who, uh, when I was working with him for a while, he would call us in for conferences to sort of do, you know, like how you know, take stock of where we were. And at one point he says, Richard, he says, you know, you're, you're, you're good, right? And I said, well, you know, I mean, I try. He goes, no, you're, you're good. You know that, right? And I says, well, you know, I, you know. And he says, okay. He says, stop. He says, tell me that you're good. I says, what? He says, say, I'm a good actor, you know. And it was one of the hardest things I've ever had to say. Because when you're saying I'm good, it's not only just I'm a good actor, or I'm a good artist. It's like, I'm good. Yeah. You, you know? Yeah. It's such, and he made me do it. And it was one of the hardest things, you know, and I make, I make my students do it now. Do you know what I mean? I think we need to do that. We need to, you know, it's not ego. It's not braggadocio. It's the truth. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you it know? does seem impossible to do it on our own. Right. Right. <laughs> so we it, have to it does. push we each need other we to need do a coach. it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, well, this was great. I think we touched on gratitude, love, mm-hmm. um, blue angels. Yeah, blue angels. <laughs> you love the blue angels. <laughs> and and um, perseverance, you know, perseverance, perseverance and against all odds. We have everything inside of us that we need. And um, yeah, I hope uh, everyone out there, if you are in the New York area, that you will come to see This Is This, August 19th, 20th, and 21st. And possibly beyond we'll see what happens but uh yeah i mean it, it, i think um do you have any final it's gonna thoughts, be, it'll be a, it's gonna be in the play the playwrights uh theater right yes in the, at hp playwrights HB. 124 bank street and um yeah i think uh, this was a very inspiring conversation where you know to be where our country's at and to be able to still find theater important and healing Right. And all uh, art. worthy, all art, all art, all art right. Yeah. Um, so thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. And do you have any final thoughts? Yeah, I just want to say thank you. Yeah, thank you, Richard. And then, um, and then, um, and I, and I look forward to, to experiencing this, this production, um, both part of it, but also just to see history happening because yeah, this is all new. 
everything is new. And I think that's what the immediacy, the immediacy, is it immediacy? Immediacy. The immediacy mm-hmm. of theater and, 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 and just being in the moment, um, it's exciting. So I, I, I got a little goosebumps here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, you know, this is happening. Good. Yeah. Good. Thank you so much. Absolutely. And that's an episode of our HB Insight series. Thank you for listening. Please like and follow us on social media at HB Studio NYC. Subscribe to us on your podcast provider for future episodes. And visit our website at www.hbstudio.org for classes and more information. Till next time. Thank you.